good afternoon everybody good evening uh, can somebody uh, just acknowledge whether you can hear me kasun i can see kasun yes we can hear thank you and so i request all of you to you have done it already to mute your uh, microphones and uh, i uh, yes it uh, isl also have done it so good evening everybody again this is a new experience for me i think you may have uh, gone through a lot of uh, lectures uh, for the bc paper through the zoom metra zoom video technology but uh, delivering a lecture of this nature even although we have had so many zoom meetings this is a first time experience for me so if i make any mistake uh, please excuse me and if you have any questions i think you can uh, raise hands uh, whether it is there i still cannot see anyway i will give you a chance to uh, ask questions also and if there is about less than 20 you can uh, uh, stop me at any time and ask a question uh, i am samita midigaspe uh, an electrical engineer serving in the ceylon electricity board but it is on my personal capacity as an engineer that i am delivering this lecture so whatever i say here is only as a professional and not as an employee of cb so you should as uh, this is going on a video and on public networks uh, you have everybody who is listening this and also if recording this uh, you have to understand that and stick to that so what is uh, said here is purely for your academic purposes and for professional purposes as a as professionals you and me we can discuss things and what i am discussing is also only as professionals and nothing to do with my employment and nothing to do with my organization that you have to understand my presentation uh, uh if i go to that you will see that it involves the an overview of the country and power sector i generally describe this uh, the importance of this at the start itself then i will go through the history of the sector how it has developed the institutions involved there are so many institutions now involved in the power sector so i will describe a little bit on that then power system related networks what are the and generation costs future plans and renewables so those are the Uh, things that i intend to cover within this two hours whether we can do it i will try to do but uh, what i this, uh, thought was when i heard that your exam is on uh, next uh, sunday is it correct uh, priyanka yeah it's on sunday it's on sunday so what i thought was okay uh, the, all this is uh, for the good of the your knowledge what i will be talking and how directly i mean how everything will be whether they will come on your exam side or not exam or examiner also uh, but uh, i will go straight to the end of my presentation so oh. one minute what is so what i thought was i will start from the end because your exam is so much close can you uh, see it okay i think now you can uh, see what i am sharing can somebody confirm that i have three na some names here so ranga can you confirm me that you can see what i am sharing now yes okay uh, 
So I will start not with electricity or anything because this is what I have uh, sort of heard or what I have seen from what people have uh, sort of uh, been discussing with you all previous lectures. I have done this lecture for about four years until 2017 and I am just starting again this lecture this year. And uh, first of all, we have to understand is that English is not our language. So it is a different language. It is something not we are very conversant with most of us, that we have to accept. Then what we have to do is we can't now, so Sunday is next, four days more, and you don't have the time to you know, go for English classes or anything. But as professionals, you have uh, go, I mean, uh, gone through records or written reports, all that in English. So when you're answering, use simple English. Don't write long sentences. When you write long sentences, you forget what we have started here. And then all these grammar problems or the uh, all other integrated problems start. Correct English, of course, yes. And then finish the sentences. That is something that I have got information that the people who start sentences do not stop. So if you use simple English and short sentences, you will be able to uh, rectify these issues. And also once you have written it, read what you have written. If you can't understand it, definitely the examiner will not be able to understand. So do that and spelling. Because spelling also matters to use of uppercase letters, that is capital and simple, and legible handwriting. So that is just like uh, finishing having short sentences and finishing sentences, legible handwriting is very important because what you write, if uh, it is a, if the <laughs> examiner has to make some uh, guessing on what you have written, that then that will not be a appropriate uh, method of answering. And also, I have written here that please practice writing answers to at least four question papers. I don't know whether you have done it that now or whether you have you are planning to do it. It will be very good because then you will pick up in your speed and also pick up where you have to, uh, you are lacking or lagging. So you can improve on that when you write uh, at least because we all, what we all do is we go through this and uh, acquire the knowledge and as you believe knowledge, that is the most important thing having a the knowledge and also knowing where to look for. That is the important thing. But on the other hand, at the examination, you should know the facts and also you should be able to answer. So what you should do is practice answer, especially this essay type answering. We are not as engineers, especially as uh, people related to mathematics and technical things or logical thinking. We are not very conversant or uh, very familiar or we don't like these essay type questions. But on the other hand, my opinion is this essay type answering is very easy for engineers or mathematically uh, aligned people because you can then logically uh, set your answer. So th these things, right? Short sentences have logical sequencing of your paragraphs and sentences, short sentences, simple English, and also legible handwriting. And also please practice. So with that introduction of a different way, I will go to the start of my lecture. So I talk to you about the overview, then overview of country and power sector. So again, what I am referring here is, you would see that I have started with an overview of the country. So this is, that is a very important thing for an engineer to have the big picture. This is what I have been saying for a long time. This may, you will think whether this will be have relevancy for you to, uh, in your examination for Sunday. Yes, so even for that you will have. Because if you have a bird's view, or a macro view, or a view from the top, you will understand where this is fitting. As an engineer, it is very important to see where everything fits in. Otherwise, you will be micromanaging things. Or having uh, what, you, uh, what we call uh, not the best solution, but halfway solutions. And also, uh, as a person of knowledge and person of uh, having uh, a good background in uh, uh, education, it is important to know where we are in relative to other things. So we'll start from the country. So knowing these things will be good for your answers also. For example, population. Now population, you, you cannot, but once again, now I'm saying what you have to be very, uh, you have to understand what I'm telling. What I'm trying to say is not to know the exact numbers. No, that is not necessary. For the exact numbers, Google is there. 
you know uh, now it is in your hands you can trace those things what you should have is understanding of where it comparison population population you should have an awareness that we have a population something around 20 million that is quite efficient but it is now increasing little bit little and I, I, now it is around 21.8 million why should you know this because in mentally when you see something some not not for any other thing when they say this the vaccine is coming you should have some awareness okay 20 million population we have 500000 another 500000 so just as a good citizen as a knowledgeable citizen you will be aware and when you are answering also when you have that type of awareness for certain questions you can have some input from these numbers but number should be no no you should understand the numbers for comparison purposes not for just exact numbers because we have a 21 million population in india has about 1 billion so that is the comparison when somebody says india's uh, transmission network has so many capacity or the generation network has so many capacity hmm? you have to understand that the population is also in hundreds of thousands of times area area is also important because area if there is a large area you just for like uh, i mean in the power sector you should have you have need a large transmission network sri lanka is 65610 square kilometers what i noticed this when i was updating this presentation today is that i had somehow mixed this with uh, mixed up this with some square mile figure and nobody had pointed out it to me for a long time so that means nobody had again checked my figures even after even though they had uh, i'm sure copied the presentation so the population area gdp per capita it is around 4000 we have we reached for these figures are 2019 data so gdp per capita is around 3800 that is 4000 we have reached the level of uh, from of uh, i think middle level development or something like that we are not the very poor category with the 4000 achievement we have passed it so uh, i think some of the loans we are now for some certain concessionary loans we are now not like not like ever then then i come to the power electricity network or the power sector the power sector has a capacity of around 3200 megawatts this is installed capacity of dispatchable plants without the uh, un, uh, non dispatchable plants we'll come to that then the capacity mix again the capacity of the system is around 40% hydro thermal 60 this is again it is changing with the input but still that is there energy mix is a little bit more with the renewables 35% because when you are talking about the renewables you have to, the energy mix you have to bring in all the uh, non dispatchable energy or the non conventional renewable energy or the other renewable energy plus hydro everything because they have energy wise they have a very good uh, representation or a share or a contribution so that that is about 35% 65% thermal the because in a specific year again you have to understand that when we think about this could be a rainy year this could be a very uh, dry year then these figures change so you have to understand that in that context also uh, when we are thinking of a figure or a number the peak demand in 2019 was 2669 megawatts and energy generation was 15922 gigawatt hours gigawatt hours is million units you would remember the energy sales is 14611 gigawatt hours i am going through this number so that you will know that we we did, so it is the energy generation is around 16 terawatt hours if you go in that pay or 16 around 16000 gigawatt hours and about 14500 we sell so the losses are in between about 1500 gigawatt hours so the transmission and distribution losses now in in the range of 8 to 9% which is very good compared to other countries also because we have done a lot that is something we can be proud of that as well as the electrification level electrification level now we are not recording because we have reached almost 100% and now what is happening is new houses and people who cannot afford or don't want to get electricity other people who are left out anyone who wants electricity supply now almost can get it that is why now the government is i think uh, having a new uh, another project 
to get give electricity to the people who have because of uh, poverty who have not taken so these two figures the uh, the transmission and distribution losses and the electrification losses level is very good for comparison with south asia or even southeast asia these are very good figures Per capita electricity consumption, 670 kilowatt hours is not very good. Not, not very, you can't say it is good. In one way that we can say is we have achieved this type of development. Uh, GDP per capita of around 4,000, even with a relatively lower electric consumption. India, uh, I, if I remember correctly, has a higher per capita electricity consumption. So one person in India consumes electricity more than us. But that is Again, uh, you have to think of the scenario and everything behind it. Because uh, in India, there are many electricity intensive industries. More large industries which use power. In Sri Lanka, it is very less. Our consumption electricity is mainly from domestic and commercial. So that must be, that could be one of the reasons that we are at this per capita electricity consumption. So that is also something, of course, not for the examination, but if you are doing some research for your masters or on your own, there is something you could uh, compare this and find out why, what is the reason of our electricity consumption is at this stage. And also, of course, we don't have winter. The heating purposes also less only, but we have a large cooling share in the electricity consumption. So that is now you see what I mentioned when I say that you should have an awareness of the sector and country. So you should start from the country. Yes, this is in Asia, next to India, of course, this island. So ours, we are not connected to any electricity network. That is one thing. And the population is around this. So then you know even when, you, when somebody says that uh, this much of new capacity is coming, when you say, when somebody is saying, yes, we have uh, two megawatts of uh, new generators connected last month. So what does that mean with the 3,200 hour requirement? It, you have to compare. And again, when India says 1,000 megawatts was connected last month, that is to a system which has more than 100,000 megawatts. That is why as engineers, we should know where the ballpark figures, that is the word that is used in uh, uh, generally with regard to the industry, as well as your country, what are the ballpark figures? what are the estimated figures, then you will have a better understanding of the sector and also you be able to answer these uh, your questions also. So that is why I start with this. Again, these are just figures. Uh, you don't have to remember all this, but if you can have that uh, aware that it is around 3,200 uh, the firm installed capacity in the CEB system is now around 3,200 megawatts. Hydro, IPP, that is the private power, as well as uh, CB uh, thermal and hydro. CB thermal plus coal. When you say thermal, it is oil fired as well as coal. In some uh, countries, when you say thermal, coal is separately named. Uh, this 3,200 does not in include, in addition to this 3,200, uh, during the past two years, uh, we have uh, had uh, CEB's one megawatt, uh, 50 uh, plants emerge, uh, that is owned by CEB that has been used uh, extensively to firm up the generation supply. There's a temporary 170 megawatt IPP, which is uh, on extended contracts for uh, and which are expiring shortly and also sometimes emergency, that is the diesel emergency plants. And this does not include the recently started uh, 100 megawatt wind in MENA, which is uh, we call semi-dispatchable. And the non-conventional renewable capacity in the system is around more than 675 now, 679 uh, at uh, 31st December, this is uh, of 2020, with 400 and around 400, meg more than 400 megawatts mini hydro, 150 megawatt wind, 50 megawatt biomass, uh, dendro, and all associated uh, ones and solar 70 megawatts. So that is how this uh, total 679 has come. So basically now what I'm saying is in, even in the previous slide, I said 
that peak demand is 2,669. That is the recorded peak in 2019. I'm not sure whether it exceeded into 2020 because the 2020 finalized data is not out. But anyway, it will be in this domain. So if you take CB's firm capacity, you'd see that it is 3,200 and you have to supply about 2,700 if the maximum comes. So there is only about 500 make, uh, difference and thermal power plants undergo uh, long time uh, replay, uh, rehabilitation uh, re uh, and repairs uh, as well as the hydro plants and hydro is dependent on uh, the water storage and the support from renewables is dependent on the intermittency because of the source in the wind. Wind is available with the monsoons mainly. Solar is available only in daytime. Mini hydro is available in the monsoon periods. So with all that, you see that we are running a very threadbare system at the moment. Just to again to show you the last about seven or eight years. Uh, in 2014, the second and third coal plants were commissioned and with that the share of coal in energy, energy share uh, is uh, varying around 30% to 35% even last year because with the, when the availability is higher. So this is from the Lakpijev coal plant, much maligned and uh, much talked about coal plant, which I think a lot of people still believe is not working, but it is contributing giving about 35% energy to the country's requirement and at a very low cost. And the oil share, you would say, is varying with the hydro share because hydro is varying with the uh, season, with the droughts or the depending on the rain rainfall of the years. And uh, the wind, and you would see solar because solar is the new thing which has come down to around 2016 and 17. The prices came started coming down and with that now we are seeing the in, uh, solar is the uh, late uh, of, out of the renewables solar is the one which has started coming in uh, to the system this is again a share of the generation of 2019 and 2020 the data will according to the available data it's almost very close to this again this is 34 percent is from coal this is uh, IPP, this is CEB, sorry, this is CEB, this is IPP, that is the private sector thermal plants, this is CB thermal plants, this is major hydro, that is CB owned, and this is mini hydro, so 24 to 30%, plus another 5% coming from various uh, renewables, that is 2% from solar, 2% from wind, and 1% from the other renewables. So that is how in 2019, the energy share was made. This is also an interesting one. This is the demand curve for the day. This is the shape that the demand curve has been having for a long time. Of course, there's a slight, uh, it's not slight, it is changing, but still you would see that CB, example can say what the country is doing at this moment. You are getting up, this is the country is sleeping and at 4.35 you or at least uh, the ladies and the people who are the gents who are helping them getting up and starting the day's work maybe somebody people are maybe going to the For uh, bread to bring bread or some something and exercising others at the house and especially putting up the lights not only the lights but the hot the hot plate or the oven or especially the rice cookers and the electric kettle so all this is and the lights this starts at 4 30 around and at six o'clock it start, stops and there is a uh, coming down of the demand at that time again around 7.30 because everybody is leaving. Now you are arriving at the office and the peer or somebody else or yourself is putting on the lights, then the ACs, then the computers. Then you are working. So the working is very flat. But again at 12.30, you would see there are some dips because in some places, 
especially in uh, factories, the machines are being shut down. Otherwise, at your offices, I don't think you will be shutting down your computers or the lights. And at five o'clock, uh, around three o'clock, again, there is, I think, uh, because people want to have some tea and then you are leaving the office. The lights are switched off for the and then after 5.30, the issue starts because then you are putting on your lights and your team. Those are the two major things that is being started from 5.30 right up to 9.30. When we to 7.30, that is in the night, 7.30 p.m., 7, 7.30 p.m., this is the peak that we are reaching. This is the peak we are having in Sri Lanka for a long time. So what we are doing, so the electricity, the maximum Peak demand, what is being done, it is for, uh, for lighting as well as uh, for, for, of course, air conditioning is also taking a considerable amount from starting from around uh, 9.30, even going right up to about midnight. Air conditioning load is also there. So when you reach for people who have air conditioning, now air conditioning is becoming not a luxury. So people are putting on their air conditioners. And with that also this demand. So air conditioning and lighting plus steam. That is the most of this demand is doing. So our highest peak, which is running for the peak time, which is for about three hours, starting from 6.30 to 9.30, uh, we are using the highest capacity, the demand in this time. So what are we doing? Are we using that for productive purposes? That is something which has always sort of bothered me that we are doing almost in CB with the you would agree or not, uh, we are trying our best to give a good supply to the uh, consumer and especially maintain the supply at this time and also at a loss supplying. And are we, now when we I say we, that is as citizens of the country or consumers of electricity, are we utilizing this energy for productive purposes? That is something that we all have to think. And also you would see that we need to have generation from about uh, 1,200. This is this is something uh, drawn some time back. So even at that time, from about 1,200 to 2,000, within about half an hour, so one hour, 800 megawatts. Now this is much uh, higher. Where you have to uh, not much higher, even though higher by megawatts, maybe the ratio is not so much. But still about 1000 megawatts have to be started and increased the generation within short time. And those generators will not be utilized only for a short time. So that is the way of our demand variation, our demand curve. And these are the uh, daily, again, uh, daily load curves over the years of the peak years. Uh, the latest one is uh, 2020, which is at the top. And what we are seeing is uh, the day, the day peak and the night peak. The day peak, that is the daytime, and the night peak in the evening is coming close. Even the 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 nighttime low demand uh, peak also uh, has considerably now moved up, especially uh, in the late years. So our difference in the ratio between the top peak and the daily uh, daytime as well as the uh, non-peak time is reducing but still that uh, shape is there but uh, CB uh, planners are now have uh, sort of identified that this uh, is going to change uh, in the future in about 10 years by in about 10 years time because already in Colombo city the peak is uh, in the daytime. So with that, with the sort of the urbanization and the economic improvement, uh, like in many other countries uh, in the time to come, the data, the peak will most likely move to daytime from the evening. But still for a long time, about next four or five years, or even for the next 10 years, uh, most likely the shape will be like this. And I, now I will just run through the history because uh, when I when we look at our infrastructure energy sort of background uh, of what is required, what is uh, required from us, uh, from the lecturers to uh, 
speak of or to tell you the historical development or the history of the sector is also the energy infrastructure is also stated so i will just run through this not go into details uh, the first electric light of course was seen in according to the records in 1882 from a ship where it, uh, steam, we think a steam engine was used to provide uh, to produce or so generate electricity and uh, i will pick one from this uh, the in 1980 18 engineer dj vimala surendra presented his famous paper on economics of hydropower utilization to the engineering association again i would like to focus or bring your attention to this because we all think of uh, engineer vimala surendra as we know of him as father of hydropower in sri lanka and as elect, uh, uh, as engineers we think to think okay he he he's he would have gone through these electrical calculations and uh, of course he had he was a qualified mechanical engineer as well and also in civil engineering matter so he did all the designs required the for water and the uh, structures in the lakshapana stage 1 or the conceptual design but this economics of hydropower utilization is not a pure technical or design document it is of more important that is what i would like to say that is where you are as engineers your input should come economics and engineering always matters it's always linked together whether you are working in a private sector organization doing uh, maybe same uh, factory work factory production or you are a pl planning engineer in a utility whatever it is the economics or the finances matter you finances at one end and economics at one end so what mr engineer vimala surendra presentation or the his paper uh, it is available i think even in the internet or at the isl library i have seen it so it is some good document for you to read that was not purely for generation of hydro power that he had seen this uh, Lakshapana Falls and thought that it is a nice place uh, to generate electricity. Okay, and uh, he has designed the power station. Not that he has done his calculations, his economic calculations, his presentations, logics, everything for hydropower utilization. Because we, when we invest something on in, an engineering matter, it has to have returns. It has to have benefits, and those benefits should be more than the cost. There should be return for the first people or the if it's a investor or with the country or the people that are investing so what he said was that this electricity that is generated from hydropower potential could be utilized for the agriculture of sri lanka as well as for railway and that was in 1918 105 uh, 3 years have gone and neither of those utilizations we have done of, other than the generation of electricity we are still talking about railway electrification and this was presented by engineer vimal surendra more than 100 years ago using uh, making uh, uh, for agriculture use in urea production as well as uh, for railway electrification using uh, electricity the first uh, large scale hydropower station Lakshapana was commissioned in 1950, and the Kalanithis steam power plant in 1962. The Victoria, the uh, sorry, the Mahavali first power plant was in 1976 for Kuala. That was not in the, as accelerated scheme, but as 30-year scheme under the accelerated scheme, Mahavali was uh, sorry, Victoria power station was commissioned. The first. private sppa that is the standardized power purchase agreement mini hydro plant because in 1992 there was a policy decision by the government that uh, for that it is time for and it was it is economical now to develop even the small hydro power plants which are potential hydro power potential that was available but that the state the government or the ceb was not going to invest on this because two things one is the requirement of capital was becoming hard for the government to fund and because of high hoards and with that and also this was a late uh, mid 90s the 
restructuring, privatization of the electricity industry and the power sector was also coming up uh, through the world agencies like the World Bank, ADB, and everything. So with that, uh, there was a policy decision and following that, the uh, first mini hydro power plants were connected in 1996 on the standardized power purchase agreement. And in 1997, private uh, first IPP, that is the thermal independent power producer was connected in 1997. The first coal power plant was commissioned in 2011. The national grid was reconnected in 2013 to the north. Uh, and uh, coal power plant balance paths were commissioned in 2014 and in 2016 and 17. The first tenders, because you have to understand, uh, even though I can't go into details, in the first instance from 1996 right up to around 2016, renewables were uh, developed on the basis of what is called the feed-in tariffs or the standard tariffs. But two, from 2016 and 17, due to policy decisions as well as uh, legal uh, requirements, uh, NCRE 2, uh, non-conventional renewable energy 2, were, tender, were started to tender. So their tenders were first floated in 2016 and then 17. So that is the historical development I just want to. And again, the, because I talked about the history, I am showing you the historical share this is not share, this is uh, in absolute values, the generation, how it has improved, and the hydro is uh, has not, because no major hydro plants are up to, after 2003 were introduced, only the mini hydro contribution, but this has both uh, major hydro and mini hydro in this uh, graph, this figure, hydro, oil, then coal, and then the what is what we call the non-conventional renewable or the other renewable energies, which includes mini hydro, wind, and solar. So you are seeing from 1996, which started as a very dot, and now it has a considerable share. Now I will have a sip of water. If you excuse me. I will come to the institutions of the in the sector uh, because when now we have talked about the overview of what what is this system, what type, what is the capacity of our system, where it is, it is located in Sri Lanka in this this type of a economy and a country, and how it has developed, at least the infrastructure has developed, then. The institutions, the policy making is done by the Ministry of Power. The ministry has uh, different names. Now there's a state ministry also special, uh, specifying on uh, project implement, spe specified projects and uh, the renewable energy. Then the major ministry, the cabinet ministry, which is the Ministry of Power, it represents the government, the policy making and fund control. So basically the ministry represents the people of the country. Because the policy is coming because when the government or the executive or the parliament decides the policy and it is approved, it is coming through the government. Then Ceylon Electricity Board, which is a government owned board, it is 100% owned by the government. And it has the transmission monopoly in the Sri Lanka, hydro and thermal generation, as well as this majority distribution or a huge component share of the distribution. But with regard to generation, you can't say the share is huge now. Then there are government-owned companies, uh, so OCV subsidiaries. LECO was first introduced as uh, the distribution agency to take over, especially the in those times, about maybe even up to 1970s, the distribution at uh, village level or town level was done by uh, local, uh, local government bodies like the town council or the urban council or the municipal council, but there was a lot of issues with regard to them because they could not maintain the system and uh, they could not give supplies. And because of that, uh, the government at that time decided to have, uh, after certain studies, decided to uh, uh, have a new company, which is Lekolanka Electric Company. And it was uh, located 
it was given the responsibility in, uh, in the urban coastal belt in the western uh, part of the country the western coast right down from about uh, gol area up to bigam then another uh, offshoot that came out from government owned and cb subsidiary is the ltl holdings which started as a lanka transformers limited as a transformer production company now it has gone into vast areas uh, starting as a the as the lanka transformers limited now it is known as the ltl holdings so those are government owned companies and we are going to take the institutions in the sector or the components in this uh, multiple sector ipps they are also a very important part the private thermal power producers who sell power to cb on long term contract specific contracts which are called take or pay contracts because take or pays these contracts are based on the principle that their return or the, their investment will be recovered in the specified 20 year term and whether they are uh, utilized or not <laughs> whether the Sorry. Power sec. Whether the uh, IPPs are utilized or not, uh, I mean, whether they generate or not, they are. They will be paid their investment based on their availability. The energy is a pass-through cost. They cannot make profit on energy because they are uh, required to. They are paid on a given uh, efficiency, which is agreed at the. commission or at the tendering process so that is the basis of ipps and there are other private generators especially the ones who are supplying non conventional renewable energy they have standardized power purchase agreements because the ipps have specific agreements for their specific plants but the other private generators have their so the the, uh, the renewable for the renewable sector there is standardized power purchase agreement and these agreements are all below 10 megawatts so far uh, all uh, sppas all, all the ncre private uh, projects have been below 10 megawatts then there is the sri lanka sustainable energy authority which is uh, has legal authority or statutory authority with regard to renewable energy with the uh, 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 passing of the SLSCA Act, the renewable energy resource in the country is uh, was declared as owned by the republic. Of course, in the constitution also, I think it is said that all the resources in the country are owned by the republic, and on behalf of the republic, the uh, regulatory powers for renewable energy is. exercised by the sri lanka sustainable energy authority so if anybody wants to utilize the renewable resource to generate power he should have an uh, so he, he has to go through the process uh, given by the sca so sri lanka sustainable energy authority and he should and he should have a energy permit before he could sign up power purchase agreement with ce this is for renewable energy total power sector regulator is the public utilities commission of sri lanka so the electricity sector is completely regulated by the pucsl it is the technical regulator safety regulator as the economy as well as the economic regulator of the sector again i in the next i i am just going through the acts which is linked to the what i was uh, saying previously uh, there are two major acts relevant to the sector that is the sri lanka electricity act number no. 20 of 2009 previously it was 19 for the last act electricity act was in 1950 so a new act was introduced in 2009 which is known as the uh, which is the electricity act number no. 20 of 2009 and the cb act of 1969 which regulates the ceb while the sector is regulated by the sri lanka electricity act number no. 20 of course the slsc has its own act which was passed in 2007 and the public utilities commission act number no. 35 of 2002 the regulator is pucsl policy maker is the ministry of power and energy transmission licensee remember 
there is only one transmission licensee in the country. It's about it's the CEB. Generation licenses, there are the, the CEB, IPPs, which I said previously, the thermal power, large scale thermal powers, the SPPA holders, as well as, yes, the SPPA or the uh, NCRE project generating companies. Distribution license, there are five licenses. CEB has four licenses given for four geographical areas, which CEB is, uh, has. Uh, for in its structure for distribution divisions, then there is the LECO. LECO is the other distribution license. So we went through the institutions which are there, who gives the policy, who regulates, and who acts, and what, the, what are the other agencies who have influence on this. This is uh, for everybody who, just for your understanding, because. Uh, even though you may, all of us may have learned this at the, uh, studied this in the university, electrical people definitely, but others also. Uh, so what we have to compare, this is an electricity network, basically, a single line diagram showing the different uh, aspects of the components of a transmission network. You have to think of electricity network also has some sort of a transport network. It transports energy from one place to another. So in the conventional, if you think of the conventional system, there would be generators, which is called here G, and the generators will generate electricity, and the electricity is generally uh, generated at a lower voltage, and for transmission purposes, it will be increased to a higher voltage in the region of either 220 kV or 132 kV. So this once this is converted to or transformed to 220 kV, it will go through the transmission lines. And here it is showing that if we go to another trans to grid substation, what we call. So this is basically this electricity is generated, put in a different type of a lorry, or on a large lorry, you can say, and transported along a highway. And in, from the highway, this is brought down to 132 kV level. And from there, another lorry is coming up. Another path is there. So other lorries also will be coming. They join and they go to a 130 kV grid uh, substation. Here, there is not only generation or the supply is coming. Here, there is a customers or distribution. The distribution, because of this, so the, the voltage is brought down from 132 to 33. And from 33, the 30, these are the lines which you see most of the, what some people call uh, high tension lines. Uh, the 33 kV lines are the ones which are go, going through uh, the uh, large type lines that you see going in uh, higher poles, tall poles, as well as towers along your roads, as well as through the uh, via land or through uh, uh, paddy feeds like that. the 132 lines of course you can see that they are very tall and they are less what is going through all around is 33 kv so this is through the small lorries or the through small roads you are again taking this and then bringing down to 11 kv and if it is 11 kv you give to bulk suppliers and let go in another one what is generally done is this 33 kv line is you have the distribution transformers, which you would see in most of these poles in the roads. Uh, these are situated or installed uh, on the co concrete poles. And from there, the supply is coming to your house. So this is the retail place. These are the middlemen. You can think of in that way. So in a conventional system, which was there some for about uh, maybe 50, 60 years, there is the generation. There is transmission at various voltage levels. Then there is some transmission or medium voltage transmission to 33 kV level. And from 33, then from distribution substations, you have you give supply to residential customers. But now things have been disrupted. It's disrupted by newcomers. Newcomers always disrupt things and make it a headache for conventional people. The electricity industry is a very conventional one because most and none of those theories or even the equipment 
rather than I think power electronics and related control systems has changed maybe even from second world war times. And that is coming in of renewables. The renewables are most of the times connected to 33 kV. Uh, and at 33 kV level, when connected, so this is not so setting up of protection systems, transformers, lines, all this has become difficult. But of course, you have to adjust to that. So most of the times, these non-conventional renewable energy sources are connected at 33 kV levels, if not otherwise, other than farms, which is a, in Sri Lanka, the example is a Manavin Park, which is just being commissioned. So that is, other than that, all non-conventional resources are connected at 33 kV. So when you connect at 33 kV level, uh, you, for a conventional system, you have to do change. So these are the things that you have to get adjusted and sometimes cause problems. The present transmission network, of course, this is not very clear. What is in uh, purple is the 220 kV transmission network. In green is the 132. So in Sri Lanka, there are only two transmission voltages now. The first transmission voltages in Sri Lanka from Laksapana to Colombo was 66 kV, but now it is no more used. The lines have also been taken out. Now, the main uh, network is from 132 kV, and the other one is the 220. So, 220 comes from started, the 220 kV network started to bring Mahavali power to Colombo. Now, Norochole or the Lakpije Putlapo power is also brought to Colombo, the Western province, through 220 kV lines. And also, there is an alternate line to un connecting Anuradhapura. And now, Anuradhapura through MENA, the 220 lines have now been just commissioned. So, that is the network. And I will later show you what are the plans for the future. So, now you have some awareness of the of a transmission network and present transmission network also. I will not explain on these uh, diagrams. This is the Mahavali complex, how the water is uh, diverted and how the system is there. Then the Laksapana complex. Of course, Mahavali complex, there is a lot of irrigation requirements. By, by Laksapana complex, almost no irrigation, but only water supply requirements, that is bringing, bringing water supply. Uh, then there is the Valavi Basin. Uh, where there is more, some irrigation, there is of course irrigation requirement to go to Valavi and also in some other. Uh, because I, I am here in Laksapana complex and because uh, sometimes question, uh, you have questions also asking this uh, environmental issues and social issues, of course inundating an area or uh, why by a dam and uh, inundating area taking people out of course have a lot of repercussions and a lot of effects environmentally. So and socially damaging. And when new projects are coming up, people does do uh, as individuals, as well as stakeholders, as well as environmentally conscious people, people have objections uh, raised. When you try to build up, uh, especially large scale reservoirs, now almost uh, impossible. Most of the potential have been utilized in Sri Lanka, but still, if you are thinking of a reservoir, you have very difficult. But an example is uh, what I want to draw is this Kehel uh, Gamoya and Kamaskeliya, the Castle Reed Dam and Mausakale Dam. If you think about uh, 100 years ago, or oh, if you go through some literature or some novels which talk about the area down the low, low level road area and why high level road was built. High level road was built because low level road always was underwater. And also, if you talk with some people, Older people, they will say right up to Avisavelo, even beyond that, Kataldua, everywhere there was flooding. Of course, now also there is flooding, but when you talk about in the 1920s, 30s, there was huge flooding. And also, Colombo, the, there, there is a huge water demand, drinking water demand. And the Colombo city area is mostly supplied by the Kalatuava and uh, Lavugama reservoirs. But the Greater Colombo area, Kaduela, Maharagama, and those places, Nugegoda, 
where do you think it is being supplied? Is from the Amatale pumping station. Of course, our water board friends would uh, have more specific information. But what I am trying to say is, during the dry periods, how are we getting water? We are getting water because Kasari Reservoir and Mausakale Reservoir stores this water during the monsoons and utilizes them in the dry period through for water for power generation as well as for uh, other purposes as well as for power generation. So just a an example, and also this flooding of those low-lying areas have come down drastically with the building of these reservoirs. So people do not consider these benefits, which are of high, high level, large-scale benefits, when you uh, just when you think about the effects. Of course, there are benefits and uh, effects, but when you are thinking of effects, you have to consider benefits also of other benefits of or not only the direct benefits, but the in indirect benefits as well. This is just to give you a glance or an idea of the types of generation. We have many generation technologies in Sri Lanka. Maybe some, there may not be countries which have this type of uh, combination. We have the hydro turbines, wind turbine, steam turbines in coal. Then there are steam turbines in the combined cycle power plants then steam turbines in biomass and municipal solid waste. Then the gas turbines in Sri Lanka is running on diesel because we don't have gas yet. And the combined cycles running one, some are running on diesel and some the naphtha is being used. Then the diesel engines running on furnace soil, which are the private, most of the private. Then, but the Sapugaskan, the CB plant is running on residual oil from the oil refiner. So this is another type which has, this, even though the same technology, the fuel has to be used in a different way. Then there is the diesel engine fired, diesel fired diesel engines that is utilizing diesel fuel, which are the what we call the emergency power, which is so you, uh, procured for a short term period. Then of course the solar photovoltaic, which has come recently. So you would see a multitude, a huge mix of generation technologies are used in Sri Lanka. Then tariff, which is something controversial. Uh, there are so many tariff categories in Sri Lanka, in the domestic also. And if you had gone through, if you by any chance had gone through the 2005 national energy policy, it would, you would see that one of the major things it says is that in two, 10 years time, there should be less categories. The categorization on the block should come down. But compared to 2006 and by 2014, the categories or the blocks had increased. And uh, the, there is the domestic tariff, there's a general purpose tariff, then the industry tariff, and the hotels and governments also have separate tariffs. The specific tariffs, of course, you can go into CB as well as PUCSL websites. And I advise you to just to have a glance through that because, again, that is good information when you're writing. You would see the domestic then again electricity is one of the few things where if you buy large you are charged more generally if you buy wholesale whatever products you will get a discount but not electricity in electricity if you use less you are charged less if you charge more if you use more you are charged more. and the, the there is the fixed charge as well as the energy charge Fixed charge is basically for the maintenance of the system to deliver the contracted amperage to you. Of when you are having your electricity connection, you have an agreement where CEB promises to give you 30 amperes, that or 60 amperes, so 30 amperes three days. So that connection is there. Not only the connection, CEB has to procure equipment to that supply. When and where you switch on your lights, and if you Go for 30 amperes, then CEB is required to have that machinery. So that investment cost is theoretically in your fixed charge, and the energy charge is the operation cost of the uh, generation or the variable cost that is incurred when generating a specific or supplying you a specific amount of kilowatt hours. 
and there is also the maximum demand uh, which is given for industry and general purpose and now of course there is the time of use which was already there for that is uh, based on the demand at the high demand type side you you are charged higher and the lower at the lower demand side which is which was there for some long time for industry now it is there for general purpose and even the domestic customers now have the type of use tariff it was introduced specially to promote or support people who are using electric cars and also for other people if they can utilize it to support the system also because the power system would like to have lesser demand on the peak times and a higher demand to bring up the demand on the off peak times uh, of course the electric car industry has in sri lanka has not uh, sort of developed to the extent that it was projected and therefore the use of the time of use uh, tariff by domestic customers are still at a lower level planning so one of the most important things for a utility is to plan so future generation development is for the country is done by ceb uh, which is a statutory requirement under the uh, oversight of public utilities commission of sri lanka uh, according to the electricity act there are certain duties uh, given to ceb with regard to future generation development and oversight powers to PUCSL, the regulator, and the future generation development is based on lease cost. Uh, it has been generally, and CB carries out these studies and publishes the long-term generation expansion plan, the lease cost long-term generation expansion plan for a twenty-year period, and this is based on macro-level demand forecast. The demand forecast is also made, and after that, it is published for a twenty-year period. and then based on this uh, generation expansion plan the transmission plan is prepared and the, at regional and provincial level the distribution plans are also prepared so this is a sort of a linked exercise and also it is done regularly updated or new plans are made because the circumstances and the externalities change in the new context the generation planning has to consider policy guidelines government policy in addition to the reliability and the cost effectiveness that we have been usually doing because the government policies has now been bringing now bringing new things into the uh, planning process what are the uh, plan projection uh now there are about uh, 3 megawatt uh, umaw is 120 megawatts this is wrong this is not 150 it is 120 megawatts then broadlands morogolla uh, umaw and broadlands of course are under construction morogolla has just started uh, and the unof unfortunate situation is other than these two hydro power stations umaw and broadlands morogolla just started and you see that they are all uh, total capacity is also around 200 around 150 180 there is no uh, power plant under construction since 2014 there has been no new uh, base load power plant correct uh, which has been which is under construction even so this is one of the major issues which i will try to discuss later uh, within the time available uh and the only project that is uh, at hand is the lng base and uh, the kerala pt combined cycle one which was tendered in about i think 2 to 3 years ago and i will dis uh, discuss it uh, which uh, was recently loi awarded and it is expect and uh, the uh, it is expected to be commissioned in around 2024 and also recently the fsr u for lng because now cb is starting to uh, the lng power plants are coming up this combined cycle plants as well as the existing combined cycle plants can, can be converted can utilize uh, lng some plants directly and some uh, the, with some conversions 
and because of that, with the LNG prices rel coming relatively down, there is a requirement for LNG. But for, L for LNG to be utilized, there should be a terminal to convert, bring uh, LNG in and to convert to natural gas. So for that, CB very recently floated a FSRU for LNG, and in about uh, it's expected to two to three years time that the LNG will be available and it's accept. Uh, so if this uh, tendering or the RFP pro progresses uh, hopefully well, it will be in time when this uh, Kerala PDF uh, second LNG combined cycle plant, which is just uh, awarded, will come in line. In the pipeline, there's a combined cycle third plant before, which is again for Kerala PTA, combined cycle plant. The documents uh, has to be approved and then as I would say, documents when we are doing a procurement of this nature, as per the uh, decisions and also as per law, you have to get so many approvals, even at the uh, bidding stage. Of course, the policy approval, cabinet approval, public utilities commission approval, attorney general's approval, then the environment site, the pre feasibility studies or the land availability. So, all this, even though you start on preparing the documents, it takes time. And there is a, another plan called extension to the Lakpijaya coal power plant, uh, which is also in the planned uh, stages and expected around 2025. And feasibility studies uh, have been done for subcritical coal, the possibility of uh, having advanced subcritical coal, then pump storage, which is a very important factor and which CB is emphasizing uh, as the next sort of technology that is to be coming after LNG. The next, next technology CB is sourcing is the pump storage technology because with that, our base load power plants like coal and LNG will also have a better flexibility as well as the pump storage will give a good flexibility for the uh, system uh, to incorporate or utilize the renewable energy which the system which is expected with the government new policies that CB has the network has to integrate so this renewable integration is also expected to be more uh, firm or more easier with uh, pump storage as we are talking about the future I'm showing the future network also again this may be not clear the purple line is again 220 kV. You would see new term, uh, and this is in 10 years, around 10 years time, or maybe 2027. Uh, sorry. Uh, these lines, so these were the existing lines as I showed you, but there is, as you see, a major. This new Habarani is going to be a major connecting point, and from there to Trincomalee, of course, this was planned for the Sampur coal power plants. But anyway, uh, we expect in by uh, new thermal power plants to come in here. Then, of course, another 220 line to connect uh, renewable energy resource, wind, especially wind in this area, to bring it down, and then to support the southern voltage and southern requirements. A 220 kV network is expected to come down to Hambantota, and also to have we will have need engine have generation. And again, you will see that uh, the western province, the southern, and those areas being supported by three major 220 kV connections. This is the existing one, and these will be new ones coming from Abaran. So that is the network that we anticipate, and of course, the 132 network who will be enlarged. So that is the future transmission network, just for your information and to get an idea that we have. Some key issues in the power sector. You can just, you will have to give me about one minute's uh, break to have some water. So we will start in about two minutes time.
Okay, I hope you are back. I am because I am here, and as we have a short time, we will go through this uh, key issues in the power sector. Every day, you would see in newspapers or now in Facebook or internet or in the televisions uh, issues in the power sector. So everybody knows so seems to be knowing, known or having very good understanding of the issues of the power sector. So these are the issues that to my understanding that have become uh, delayed. Uh, sorry, the major issues. One of the major issues is delays in implementation of power projects, especially large scale base load power projects. From the past, of course, uh, the sample poll should also go to the past. So past, there are three major uh, examples. Putlam Coal Power Project. The first coal power plant was mentioned or planned in the 1982, I think 82 or 83 in that region. Uh, Yes, uh, in that era, in a generation plan to come in about 15 years time, that is around 1994 or something like that. But it took almost 15 years after that to get the feasibility studies going on. And the feasibility studies and everything was completed by 1999 and fund, funding was ready by 2000. And if funding was ready, and if that, uh, of course, uh, there were social issues, there were environmental issue, issues, there were concerns, and environmental uh, reports uh, or the assessments were done in this regard, social assessments were done. And uh, in all aspects, the project was ready and funding was available from Japan, concessionary financing was available in, by 9, 2000. But what happened was there was a protest from the people of the area that you have to accept. That happens uh, anyway. And of course, it is a, something that is well known and uh, happening everywhere. So what we call NIMBY, not in my backyard. We, we also suffer that. Even I have protested for certain things when it is coming up close to my house. So you have done. But on the other hand, if everybody does that for everything, there is an issue. And that is where a government has to take decisions. And of course, you have to compensate to the extent possible for the effects that an infrastructure will have on the people, on specific people, to the level that it is possible and economic. So what happened in two, around 2000 was that there was this uh, uh, pro protest or the movement against the coal power plant. And also there was the, the part of the church, especially the church close to that, the Catholic uh, bishop close to the area. And some people protested. And what happened was in the 2000 presidential vote, both candidates at work one stage or the other, because one, I can remember which candidate said it first, said that, no, I'm going, not going to implement this because he did, the candidates did not say that because I get the Catholic vote or whatever the people who are protesting. And within two weeks or within a week, the other candidate also promised that. And when the president, the next, the president came or the, who, who won the presidency, and after that, uh, by 2002, there was a change of government. And with that, it was further emphasized. Uh, in that period, there was the president and the prime minister was from two parties. And both had emphasized. And he said, which is, I think, true, where the Japanese ambassador was turned away. Of course, the government has all the right to take the such decision. It's a policy decision. So the bureaucrats or the government officers uh, cannot go against that. But of course, when you look back, you can see that it was a very costly decision for Sri Lanka. Because of that, the coal power plant coming up was delayed for more than years. And 
the concessionary financing and the Japanese product that we could have got, uh, we had to turn to China. And we have to appreciate the Chinese for giving us that uh, financing at a time in 2005 and 6 when everybody else was not giving us finance. So you have to accept that. But we could have had that project six years previously with the separate funding and separate technology if the policymakers had thought of other ways. Upper Gokmule project, two similar delays because there was uh, internal politics, regional politics was involved, and of course, people. But the inundation from Upper Gokmule, it was just what you call a pond, not a high, large reservoir. And all those people were given houses. Of course, there are effects, environment effects. But even if you walk on a road, there is an environment effect. Or effect on the environment. You cannot, you, you can't say that there is no effect, but you have to minimize the effects or mitigate the effects. That are the, those things. And similarly, Sampur coal. For the Sampur coal power plant, it got delayed because Sampur coal power plant, the way it, that project was uh, formulated was not because of economic or uh, power related things, but because of politically related. International politics was involved in its formulation. And following that, there was huge delays in this implementing project. Sri Lanka, India, 50% uh, CB and an uh, Indian government nominated, uh, Indian government owned company, the NTPC having 50%. So those, the two, uh, the uh, so working with the uh, people from another country when, when these politics was involved and of course the civil war was going on one time until 2009 and even after that there were issues related to the uh, civil war or the uh, northeast uh, issues so with all that it took a long time for this project to get to an implementation level and when the uh, it was ready for the first rfp to be called for the rfp advertisement and everything was ready and approved and everything and it was ready for publishing in the newspapers just two days before the government decided that they were not going ahead with the sample pole power plant. And the transmission network had all already been started to be established. You would see Habarana being a sort of a hub in the even today. There is a 220 line from Habarana coming right down to Vayangu. And that is part of the network that was going to bring the sample power to Kalam. You in offhand, if you you cannot you know take this generation plan from here to there because to have a generation plant in time theoretically also for a coal plant when you are doing studies even twenty years ago eight years were taken from uh, from initial stage to commissioning but now it takes you of course you know much more and when you take this generation what happened to the transmission because your transmission network is planned what happens so we we when you plan a transmission network and you build component by component together so that the uh, thing will come together at the correct time and one component is left out so those are the effects and because the base load power plants are getting delayed we are having high prices and the other ones also morogolla because of funding issues Umawaya and Broadlands, once again, social issues. Those have affected the delays hugely. Combined cycle power plant. Combined cycle power plant uh, in Kerala PTO. It was tendered about three years ago. But due to litigation, due to delays in procurement, due to delays in procurement approval, then due to litigation. Then even after that, there are issues that have to be resolved. Of course, now the letter of awards have been given. The initial... Uh, the, implementation has now started officially but still it has taken a long time and still the power purchase agreement is to be signed because you have to understand because sri lanka is relatively a small country and our economy is such that when investors are coming to invest here they also want to put up put specific clauses in our agreements and when you have to, to negotiate those things when the approval process is longer, I will come to that clause. It's not easy to implement these things. 
So one of the major issues that has affected the Sri Lankan power sector is delays in implementation of power projects. The next one is high cost of production. Because we were dependent on oil, because the first coal plant got delayed by six years and pra practically, and even before that time, we could, if we had the coal plant, we would have had a less cost. So our major issue was that we were using oil for about 60 to 70 percent. Now, of course, with the coal plant coming in, it has come down to 20 to 25 percent because coal is giving about 30 to 30, 30 percent of the energy requirement, as I told you previously. So the high cost of production is still there. And now we are also bringing in LNG as the next option because an LNG is also uh, relatively compared to oil now has become cheaper. And with that, again, cost of production will come down. But coal is still cheaper than LNG. But whether we will be, but whether we will be having more coal plant is an issue because there are uh, international agreements that see we have gone into uh, saying that we will are committing for this much of uh, carbon emissions. And also we have a government policy which says that uh, renewable energy will be or we will not have this type of thermal or we will have this percentage of renewable energy or we will have this percentage of new renewable sharing and if you have to have that you, you cannot have more coal even though it is economical by uh, economics and what we have to still think is this high cost of production is affected because fuel we have to import whether it is coal or LNG that is gas we have to import only if the mana gas is uh, tapped that we will have our gas but still what we understand is that it's going to be a high cost and it will become economical only if the fuel is at a very high cost and then that cost will also be high so that is something we have to so that is why from one end renewables because now the investment cost is coming down on renewables wind and solar especially that it has a good uh, potential for our country in the future because the operation cost is less but and that has that is uh, touted everywhere that is said everywhere that you don't have a you don't have energy cost or fuel cost here. but on the other hand renewables have a very high capital cost cost because to get the energy that you get from one megawatt or one, or one megawatt of thermal, you need about uh, two or three times higher capacity of solar or wind power installed. I hope you understand because the plant factor or the utilization factor, the thermal plant, if you have the fuel, you can run it. If you can you if you buy the fuel and store it correctly you can use it so they have a 80 to 85 percent plant factor but the others depend on resources major hydro again you can store and you can use you can you have but the solar if you take solar power plant has about 16 percent plant factor so if you have uh, to get the same energy that you get from the same from to get the same energy, you know it four times the capacity, or even though you are not getting it in the same time on the required time, at least if you make a comparison, you need four times the capacity so per kilowatt price, per kilowatt hour wise. Of course, now especially solar has come down compared even to comparison to coal. But you have to think about the capacity as well as. When you need capacity as well as the amount of energy, you will need higher. So then, and the capital costs, and also both in solar and wind. Again, one you have to consider is that of the capital cost, more than eighty percent, close to ninety percent, is a foreign cost. Or you have to that capital cost you have to pay out. So again, that advantage of renewable is there, but you have these issues also. So the high cost of production will be an issue for a long time in Sri Lanka.
another one is the losses of the sector especially the cb cb is selling below cost of production uh, i think i have another one yes tariff is not matching the last uh, point here in 2019 the average selling price was 1629 while the average cost at selling point was 2329 so every unit that cb was selling in 2019 about 6 rupees cb was losing so two reasons one is we have a high cost of production because we do not have base load and lower cost power plants on the other hand our tariff is in such a way that it is not met so in both of this is making the organizations uh, financial losses and with these losses this is linked not only cb this links the petroleum corporation as well as the ipps as well as the banks the government banks uh, to which cb is linked because cb cannot make the uh, recover its costs it does not pay to petroleum corporation so the petroleum corporation is making losses but on the other hand cb buys from petroleum corporation but does not pay to it. so petroleum corporation liability is also go up cb is also so and the government is having a problem how to balance this thing so it is affected and cb may take a overdraft from a bank and pay it so this is all linked and it is this like a chicken and in a problem it is continuing so those financial losses makes an organization also very vulnerable it cannot make its own decisions and it is pushed by because it is it has to depend on others on financial it is like when you are on rent on a on a house you are not the owner so you have to depend it's like when you are dependent on your parents you can't do as like you like or when you are on a loan to a bank something like that you may be wanting to do good things also but that also you cannot do then what happens is this cycle repeats and the sector is brought down continuous another issue is policy changes you have a policy that this is what happened uh, what i said at sampo you have a policy that you will have a coal plant here and at a time when all linked things have started up you suddenly change your policy so those things affects the power sector and especially for long term projects when this happens to start up a new project at a new place with the linked infrastructure it takes long years and also one something we have to think to think is that when the lead time is about 8 years for a project and the time of the electoral elected representatives of sri lanka is now 5 years and if you take 8 years when you are elected during your time if you cannot make this project viable or implement it you lose interest in that because you may be constructing it for some other god so that also loses interest on long term projects conflicting policies tariff and net metering so that is uh, one example uh, the solar tariff of uh, 22 rupees for the first 7 years and 15 for that that's so that that is a 18 rupees uh, if you take the full 20 years so at 22 rupees what happened is people it is it has a return for the investors so the customers invest on it and install the solar panels so when they install the solar panels uh, of course they generate electricity first what they do is they consume less and because they consume less uh, they have their own generosity they are, the amount they are getting from the grid that is only during the off peak hours and when the it is net made net maybe they have not even consumed only export so for that export of energy cb may pay you but what happened to the his consumption previously that customer was in the highest category because of uh, generally the well to do people 
have a higher lifestyle and because of that they have a higher consumption total consumption and he would have been charged around 45 rupees for if he was consuming more than 180 units the consumer would be charged for the balance units at 45 rupees per unit what happens cb now he is not uh, he is not paying for that unit he may be still using it and he or he may not be he, he may be using at a lower tariff but he becomes a net export but he consumes energy at peak times it, it exports at uh, day time but still that 45 rupees is lost sub uh, customer is lost to see that income is lost to see so that is a conflicting policy even though the solar coming in may be economically good for the country cbs tariff collection cash collection is affected by this tax also does these things taxing also especially for when you tax on fuel the dispatch is done based on the dispatch is done on merit total or the variable cost so cb would be dispatching power plants based on the merit total so the merit total is based on the financial price in which includes the tax and if it has if there is a higher tax on a certain fuel cb may not be uh, dispatching with that plant but in the end because of the tax there may be uh, distortions so that is another conflicting policies another key issue that is coming up is uh, the climate change commitments or the environmental international commitments that we have made to the paris uh, co, co uh, come, uh, climate agreement and other agreements that uh, are coming up coal is still to a great extent the most economical in sri lanka's context could be but it has a higher ghg emission internationally it is becoming less and less possible to use coal and similarly we are we will also find it difficult because even financing for coal is becoming difficult and with that because of a global issue where our contribution is almost very minimum you would see that we were still we are still using as i said at the start 670 kilowatt hours comparatively and if you compare the per capita carbon emission that is also per capita as well as absolute total uh, consumption of carbon is also very less hours and coal power plant we started only the first power plant in 2010 all others have gone up polluted used coal and now it is affecting us and our ability to have our economy at a lower cost so these are global issues but now we have to have local solutions affecting us so that is another issue integration of intermittent renewables which i will touch later environmental and social issues on site locations i said it it, it is becoming very difficult not only now generation but even a transmission network it has become big one one issue is in sri lanka i think uh, even our people from water telecommunication and roads uh, sectors too will agree because compared to other island nations and especially uh, countries with uh, higher population density sri lanka has a spread out uh, housing or living areas our apartment usage or the concentrated living in one area in one part, uh, place is less because of that we are utilizing the land a lot and because of that now it is becoming very difficult to have utility corridors to have a transmission line and also because of the processes and the improvements in the legal structures from the aspect of a of human rights or the consumer <laughs> rights there are so many places ways that you can put your grievance because of that it may be good from that then i am now looking on looking from the aspect of the uh, utility the utility is having 
huge difficulty even in stringing a transmission network through relatively isolated areas and it is very difficult in sri lanka to find isolated areas also because you have uh, houses or uh, living people scattered not that sort of uh, concentrated at places and this is becoming increasingly difficult of having uh, not only the generation infrastructure but having the transmission infrastructure bringing these lines people want electricity at their at the start right at the point and also now they want uh, uh, elect, uh, the all with all the uh, high end and smart accessibilities but on the other hand we are not ready to have transmission infrastructure going through our lands or close to our lands so this is an issue that is highly affecting the system and before i forget uh, i would say a key issue in the power sector that cb has now looked at is the inter integration or the interface with the public through the social media and also through the it platforms because uh, there has been uh, which is linked to my next this there's a poor public image of cb and also public relations and also people have found it difficult and cb also has found it difficult to interact with regard to consumers requirements but now uh, cb has come up to a certain extent where cb was with regard to its uh, interaction through it or through new developments in the communication network it was much less compared to other organizations but now cb has sort of uh, is coming of age in there also that uh, if you go to the cb websites now or the social or to the google sites you can download cb's app the cb care it is trying and through it cb is trying to uh, move into the new era where people are inter ready to interact through the devices so that is a, a key issue that cb smart metering or smart grid not only that smart interaction with the people that is an issue that is facing cb which is not clear in this presentation which i wanted to mention which cb is tackling at the moment difficulty in implementation of tariff cb has not been able to get the pucsl who is responsible by statute as a statutory responsibility to see that cb does not lose does not uh, have losses due to the government policies but this statutory responsibility is not uh, exercised by pucsl and the government or the policy makers have not looked into it and cb has not been able to implement its tariffs during the last two, 20 years i think there were two or three times where when cb Uh, published a tariff up, even after uh, uh, obtaining government approval it had to be resigned uh, rescinded or cancel and a different tariff to be had to be implemented uh, implemented other key issues involvement of private investment finding required capital because capital the involvement of private investment it is coming from the requirement of capital infrastructure needs capital and uh, energy or electricity related infrastructure is highly capital needs a coal power plant or an lng plant will have about uh, 300 million us dollars uh, three, uh, for a 300 megawatt power plant so that is the basic requirement but the government is finding it increasingly difficult to in have find investment this foreign investment but or to make this investment by itself so it has to turn to the private sector because the soft loans the concessionary loans as they were there for about 20 years ago now is not there even the funding agencies are giving less concessionary type loans So the government and the government wants to utilize these concessionary loans to uh, service sectors like health, education, and they would want the 
in, on the private investment to come in. So if the private investment is coming, you have to assure their returns. So what happens is once their return is assured, and if the tariff does not match that, the entity or the government countries lose. <laughs> Another issue is uh, the regulator's role and the approvals or the uh, or the process that one has to undergo, the the bureaucracy that is has now become involved in decision making. There is not a not it is not a single decision making body. There is a multitude of decision making bodies, and if you take the present uh, requirement to get a IPP power plant start a tender and then award the tender and then sign the PPA, you have other than the normal approvals from the cabinet and the attorney general for the documents or the agreements, you have to go through the same process at least twice. That is approval from the PUCSL, approval from the uh, government, then approval from the tender board. Boards or the procurement entities. So at least three procurement processes you have to go through. And at the awarding, also, once a good, one, once the tender is evaluated and awarded by the candidate, you have to again go back to the regulator. That is, they are in the laws. So these are these laws, even though they have made it transparent and more, uh, more the, the sort of the powers or the it is now the powers have been devolved to many parties and this has made but the things i mean ex uh, implementation difficult the involvement of many institutions and also uh, when you are doing a project you need, you have other agencies also uh, legally as well as uh, they have ex executive authority they have legal authority they have formal authority they have informal authority. so all this makes it difficult for decision making and implementation in the power sector. I talked to you about tariff. And in the last 10 minutes before questions, I will touch on uh, new uh, non conventional renewable energy or the mini hydro, solar, and wind. As I said previously, mini hydro and solar were introduced. So, the means non conventional renewable energy investment in the private sector was introduced in the late 90s on standard tariff. The tariff was ever what the first it was the avoided cost tariff. So in the avoided cost tariff, and it was a standard tariff, first come, first serve tariff. First tariff is declared. And on that tariff, any person, any project company who can generate on that can take the get the approval and sign an agreement to uh, generate on that tariff. The tariff in the first 10 years, around first 10 years, was what we call the Avoided cost, that is the avoided cost of thermal. The cost that CB would have incurred, which is the energy cost, the variable cost that CB would have incurred if it was from a thermal power plant, if it utilized a thermal power plant, so that avoided cost was paid to the uh, renewable or the mini hydro or the NCR generator. So if you take CEB, Having this NC renewable or the uh, instead of the thermal, CB was not getting any benefit, but the benefit was to the country because that uh, foreign exchange was avoided to a certain extent and a local development or a investment was being done and the return. So, uh, this was the first, and it was said that this feed in tariff and this type of uh, investment would make uh, this type of tariff would make the investors more uh, relaxed and that because this was the first introduction, the industry was starting. And based on this, the industry started and developed quite well. And in around 2000 and 2007 and 8, this tariff system changed and also the Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority was also uh, institutionalized by its act. And in the same, uh, par on parallel, a new type of tariff came, again a standard tariff, first come first varied, but this time the tariff varied based on technology. So it, it was uh, based on the technology. Mini Hydro had a separate tariff, uh, wind had a separate tariff, solar had a separate, separate tariff. 
it was cost reflective tariff so there it was taken that uh, the costs for each sectors or each technologies were assessed by a committee by based by stakeholders committees and approved by the cabinet the tariffs and here the cost reflective three tier tariff that is the tariff changes uh, within the 20 years for three times coming down and also technology specific so different tariffs for different technologies based on their cost so that came into effect in 2008 around that period and avoided cost uh, tariff was no more sign, uh, coming into agreements new agreements of course the tariff signed on agreement signed on that tariff are continued and still they have been continued because uh, the they, depending on their commissioning years they have 15 year period for uh, operation so again these tariffs were given tariffs feed in tariffs or standard tariffs and first come first serve people who can connect who are able to uh, implement a project on this tariff came and joined in 2006 by 2016 and 17 it was seen that the wind the wind tariff the wind technology now had improved it no longer needed internationally it had improved it no longer needed uh, sort of industry support tariff support as it was given at the start of the uh, avoided cost principle and also the sri lanka electricity acts amendments uh, had also brought out that these uh, electricity purchasing should be done based on uh, competitive procurement following that cb with the government policy started to procure tendering from 2000 17 on 2016 the first tender for 2 meg 10 megawatt wind projects then followed by the sole first solar tender of 1 megawatt projects 60 projects out of which 35 projects were awarded and followed it up and you would see in this that now about 410 capacity has now been tendered and they are at different stages the chunakam wind project was commissioned uh, 35 projects of the 60 mega project megawatt project were awarded and out of that 20 have now been commissioned we have to remember that from the last two years uh, because of the uh, easter sunday uh, attack and then the covid it has been very difficult for the developers especially to bring their equipment have the people moving around for development clear through the ports logistics all this have been difficult and also for foreign personnel come and commission or construct plants all these have been awarded and this is as of 31st of december last year we have almost about 50 megawatts commission out of this 410 and about 100 are under construction and another some are under tendering and of course here uh, this uh, solar these two tenders this solar tender two has now been awarded this is uh, this also partly awarded so the tenders have gone so the tenders have brought the prices down the tariffs have down uh, because it is a competitive market and uh, for example for solar there have been even tariffs which have come down per unit even right down to 12 rupees 10 rupees tariffs uh, the awarded ones and the wind the commission plant at 13 rupees starting and coming down after 8 uh, years to almost 6 rupees it is the sign tariff and even the mute wind tender had prices around 10 rupees for a wind tariff for almost 20 years so with the improvements or the development of the technology in the wind and solar sectors cb going into tendering has brought about uh, prices down and of course there are issues in implementation and there is a school of thought that tendering is delaying because of tenders there is a delay of this is debatable i will not go into that but it is seen that tenders are now being implemented and in the future the, this is these are the ncr plants that are now the next step in ncr would be 
of course uh, there are three ten, uh, two tenders mini hydro ten, uh, mini hydro also cd is expecting to tender and solar and wind also some more tenders and uh, 20 megawatts of man uh, more wind power is expected to be added to the existing or the just commission 100 megawatt wind farm in addition to that cb is expecting to go into wind park concept wind sorry parks solar parks and wind parks in punarin siambalandu mana and later also in punarin because punarin area has been identified as having a huge wind potential but when you take environmental issues and social issues the total potential may not be easy to tap and in mana island it is expected that two more phases there is the possibility and it is been looked at and also a solar park uh, to be developed in siamalandu and uh, the sustainable energy authority as the regulator and promoter of renewable energy is also involved in these new projects in development those projects so that is the ncre uh, here i may be repeating myself because of renewable uh the, the because renewable is a very uh favorite thing for people to talk about and it is very attractive in three issues climate change issues increasing cost of thermal resources and the foreign currency outlaw is left and something which is not here is the short, uh, the costs have come down so so in uh, per kilowatt tower cost solar is, has come down even in some places than coal so the potential is also available in sri lanka in wind it is there is a large solar is also large but in solar the issue is land one has to accept uh, to understand that in sri lanka the land the bare land so the desert type lands are not there even in the dry zone if one new one goes in and think things are growing in the maha season in the dry zone you can you plant things even in the very dry areas so having large scale solar farms in sri lanka uh, is whether it is possible is a issue and even the solar plants that we are now having of 1 megawatt 10 megawatt scale of course a certain amount of land is has been utilized and some at a later stage there may be question to the that land could usage is the was it is using for solar is the correct thing but on the other hand solar is the fastest easiest and easiest to be implemented if you have the land dendro there is a huge potential theoretically but the issues are also huge because you have to depend on the supply of fuel which has to be grown and it has to be out, given to out growers as well as yourself but and whether you can do it and the effects on the environment of having large uh, such specifically grown plantations and also the issue of people utilizing the some not all utilizing uh, natural forest or naturally grown biomass for these dendro plants that is also there and also they are facing even the existing uh, power plants running on dendro are facing many environmental issues because they need water and the water resources are very limited and environmental issues there and also sound they are facing uh, practical issues so the intermittency is the main issue that uh, a power network has with renewables whether it is wind solar or mini hydro mini hydro the intermittency is seasonal or at least in a that the the change is day you can say it's a rainy day or not so then the, the that seasonality is sort of you can have categories where the the base time factor may be days solar of course there could be instantaneous but on the other hand you know the general you are sure that the solar panel of course like this coming starting from the initial peaking at 12 or whatever moon and coming down you know that shape but when you have uh, clouds going on and sudden clouds coming up cloud cover you will have instantaneous changes wind it has the 
highest intermittency, but in, but also in sometimes in some uh, climate uh, times or some uh, especially mon monsoon times, you have continuous wind. So the intermittency you have to depend, and it will become a very big issue when we go in for targets like 30% or 50% from renewable, then there may be times that you will have to have uh, uh, other intermittency regulatory flexibility systems also involved, such as batteries, pump storage hydro plants, or large scale, uh, more large scale plants, and also uh, have options for uh, some of the renewable plants to be shut down depending on system uh, load. These are the issues that come. Uh, with that, just uh, one more thing I wanted to tell you that most of this data are from public sources, even though uh, these are, I have been giving you some data. Most of this, I would say about 95 to 98% have come from uh, National Atlas, Central Bank Annual Report. Central Bank Annual Report, I always advise uh, people who are sitting for the, going these B paper or for general engineers in the Central Bank Annual Report. It is on the website also. There is a chapter, first chapter, which discusses the country's overview, so economic price and financial system stability, outlook and policies. So that first chapter is a long chapter, but at least the overview for the first few pages will give you a good background to the country's economy. And this is the long-term generation expansion plan is available on the web CD and UCSL websites. Most of these data is, there's a lot of data available on the UCSL website and the sustainable energy website also. So I've taken this from the uh, available data. So, you know where to look now if you want data. And what I have said, if I summarize, is that uh, first of all, when answering your paper, please practice. Do it in simple English, short sentences, and, and practice at least uh, answering four question papers. You have time for this. And uh, in the sector, you should have always have an overview, a bird's view or a macro view, where everything fitters, where it fitters. You may be working in a company or a factory. Where does my thing comes fitters into the national picture? That is very important. And also some ballpark figures, base figures, you should have some understanding. And also, as uh, if you take the questions, if you go through past questions, it is the issues that have always been uh, in the question paper. So these issues, what I went through this the, in the uh, presentation as well as in my speech or my lecture, the issues I said, you should also debate. And even though there may not be questions, why don't you write? You think about an issue in the past, this and this. Why is CB not doing this? Not a particular thing that happened to you when you went to get the connection, right? But with regard to the major issues, why is not? Why this is happening? Why that is not? Why what this should be done? So, and then you remember the facts that I we discussed: the capacities, the system, the one three two networks, the issues, the people not ready to give. Them. So then you can connect and have your answer. So that is my recommendation. Uh, of course, now our two hour has have gone. I don't know how to handle the questions. I think there are as of now twenty six people. So we will have about at least five to 10 minutes of questions. Uh, I can't see any raised hands in this. Mm. Okay. Utpala Subhasingh has raised hands. So Utpala can ask Utpala or Utpala, I don't know. Yeah, it's Utpala. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Indiana Samita, for the nice presentation. I, I have one question rela related to the, uh, the, the, the solar power plants. Yeah. Does these power plants have some sort of a, a large scale energy storage system or it simply uh, provide electricity during the daytime and the nighttime it's just idly? No energy storage, something like that. 
at uh, present all these solar power plants are pure solar power pv generators no storage okay. because storage is costly still at the moment and as of now cb is uh, uh, if you take the present day cb is ready to take uh, solar power as it is because of the, the cost advantage okay thank you i understood any more questions right uh, then thank you for listening to me or uh, okay what are you i have some uh, written questions also uh, is it uh, to direct message what are the challenges for solar power projects to domestic proposals uh any current gaps in power sector uh, if i understand the question what are the challenges for solar power projects to domestic proposals uh, the domestic actually in most of these uh, solar power projects that uh, the ipp the uh, spps that uh, invested the majority share so most of the investment are locally so when you take at this 10 megawatt level uh, the local investors are able to invest only thing is uh, if you take the investment majority of that you have to it goes out of the country at the investment side it about 80 to 90% because the wind uh, or the solar the equipment all is coming from outside and the other issue is facing the which i actually it is an issue in the power sector which uh, is facing the developers because you, now you have to take the developers also as, as i said as a very important stakeholder they are finding it very difficult to implement projects because the approving agencies are so many and also there are so many people stakeholders who are affecting during the time of uh, taking approvals during the time of construction even after commission and also the political influences that are influencing people so that is a major challenge i think whether solar or wind or mini hydro that is that has now become intense uh, when you say any current gap in the power sector it is i what i talked is there are so many gaps the major issue is uh, the issue i would say is one gap is the absence of a large scale or low cost power plants we don't have any under construction either coal or lng now we don't have a, to have a debate whether it's coal or lng either coal or lng there are no plants under construction so to depend in on uh, emergency power extension of power you will see many newspaper articles that cb has extended this that this because that is purely because there is no power no uh, new power plants coming Uh, so those are the two questions uh, that you have asked and with that uh, yes i think uh, those are the questions and thank you for being with me for two hours i know it's difficult and i also found it a little bit difficult rather than my, the usual lecture that i do at iss standing uh, and uh, thank you everybody and good luck for the exams thank you